What if I told you that everything you needed to fight cancer was already inside of you? Would you believe me? Now, I know it sounds really cliche, like something your parents would tell you, but I mean it very genuinely, as in using your own cells in your body to fight cancer for you. And if you follow along with me, and I'll actually explain how that works. I started this journey by thinking about the stars. I thought, how do they produce energy? How do they shine light? And as it turns out, they produce light by smashing or squeezing the atoms inside of them together, and they release light. Now, the opposite process is actually where they split, um, where the atoms split, and this is actually what came of the atomic bombs. Now, I thought this was really cool as an 11-year-old, and the science fair had just been announced, and I knew what I was going to do. I wasn't going to do it like a volcano made of baking soda or like make a battery turn something on and off. That was already done. That was done. I was going to make a nuclear <laughs> reactor. I was going to design. I know, I know. I, know, I didn't tell my parents. Um, and so I spent the next three months at the local library reading all I could about modern physics and special relativity and the discovery of modern physics. And then when I'd exhausted all those resources, I went to the internet. And so this was late 90s, so I go to like Ask Jeeves and Yahoo, how do you make a nuclear bomb? <laughs> Where is the uranium 235? <laughs> like writing down these critical mass equations. So I can't imagine doing that now. I think Homeland Security would have like been at the library like three minutes, or the computer would have exploded. And I'm like, what? And to think of what people use internet for when they're 11 year, old, 11 year olds now. I'm happy to tell you, I won first place in that science fair, so I completely killed it. And moving forward, I actually decided to move on to something that was less explosive. I went from looking outside for inspiration to looking inside. Because as it turns out, physics isn't just useful for learning how to create bombs. They're useful for creating images, for visualizing what the inside of our body looks like. I developed a new mantra, seeing is believing, and that had two purposes for me. One is seeing myself as a scientist, where the normative image of a scientist was not a black woman or a black person or a woman. And the other one was not necessarily proving, but reminding people that little girls like this grew up to be engineers. Oh, so adorable and like innocent right there, right? Right? <laughs> Now, all jokes aside, the other thing that I wanted to do with the imaging was to actually be able to put a special lens on an important biological question. And there are a few things more personal than cancer. According to the American Cancer Society Facts and Figures Annual Report, 15.5 million Americans are currently either living with cancer or have had cancer in their past. Each year, 600,000 people die from cancer. That's something like 70 people every single hour. If you look across all diseases, cancer accounts for one in four deaths, and it's only outpaced by heart disease. Cancer affects everyone, young, old, rich or poor. Four packs of cigarettes a day or never smoke or drink in their, a day in their lives. Good health insurance or none at all. So you can imagine why people think cancer is so confusing, and it is. Cancer isn't actually just one disease. It's based on a person's individual genetics, epigenetics, lifestyle, diet, wherever. <laughs> the list goes on. So I decided that I wanted to actually figure out how to make this personal question mean something. So I combined my love of imaging with a new quest, how do we conquer cancer? And I decided to do this in my PhD, where I developed a project using an imaging technique called multi-photon microscopy, where we can image deep into living tissue without ever cutting into it. And so the plan was this. I was going to put cancer cells in the bloodstream, and I was going to watch them go through the bloodstream, find out when they go into another organ, such as the brain, which is what you'll see in a second, catch them, and then see what they do when they get there. Sounds relatively straightforward, right? Yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> so 
if this technology works the way it's supposed to, you're going to see the vessel. So this is a living mouse brain. And if you look closely, there, look, look there, there it was. Did you see it? See, that was the only one I saw. <laughs> so as it turns out, this is really hard. I'm trying to find a cell that's 10 microns in size and a field of view that's 3,000 3, times larger than that. It's like one of those Finding Waldo puzzles, except Waldo is always moving around. And when I looked back on it, I basically spent half of my 20s in a dark laser room looking into mouse brains, looking for that one little cell. So I felt like a failure. I felt like I wasn't really able to answer or design good questions, and I was really thinking, what am I doing here? But in those hundreds of hours of observation, I saw something else that was far more valuable, another type of cell that was in the brain, and these are immune cells. This is a microglia. Microglia are the immune cells of the brain. They're the most common cell population there, and if you can tell, they are always extending their little arms. I like to think of it as dance parties in your brain. And it's happening right now, and it happens all the time. And they're constantly looking for anything that could go wrong in your, in your brain. Every four, out, four to six hours, they've actually surveillance your brain at least once. And let's say they find something, then what happens? Well, this is what happens. This is a live image of a brain. So you can see that something happened there, and they're extending their processes, their little limbs. They're saying something happened there. Let's investigate. This is happening over the course of hours. And so then I thought to myself, this is what happens all over your body. There are immune cells everywhere in every single organ. And instead of using just my eyes to find the cancer cells, we can use our immune system to do that for us. Scientists like me are taking advantage of this very principle, fighting personal with the personal, using your personal immune cells to fight for you. I want to take a second here and also talk about what I mean by fighting personal with the personal. We often personalize cancer as if it were a person and it had some sort of morality. We wear it pink and we tell people, you're fighting cancer, kick cancer in the butt, right? And that can be a really encouraging, inspiring visual to help people get through the day-to-day -day pro day -day process of going through cancer treatment. But there's another side to that where it can actually make people feel worse. Why me? Why the person I love that has cancer? And how come I'm not fighting hard enough? I'm trying, I'm giving it everything I can, and it's not working. I don't like that type of narrative. And so when I say personal, I want you to understand that I mean using the cells inside of you and trying to get them to fight better for you. I don't mean that anyone deserves to die from cancer or that cancer is about what anyone deserves ever. Now the next thing I want to talk about is what is this immune system that I'm talking about? Well, it's a series of cells, tissues, and organs that are designed to protect your body. Think of it this way. They have the lymphatic, lymphatic vessels, which are basically their own hi personalized highway so that they can get to places of infection really quickly. They have these little gas stations, which are known as like the thymus or these other organs, where they check in, recharge, collect information from other cells. And they also have their own production system in your bone marrow, where they're constantly making new cells. We often talk about the immune system in two components, the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. In the innate immune system, everyone is born with this, and it's just designed to recognize anything that is foreign. And usually, if they can, they will eat them and get rid of them. They will clear them away. And they will also clear away um, anything that is dead, and they will form a physical barrier between anything that's invading your body. So think of when you have a cut or bruise and it starts to swell. That is part of your innate immune system taking effect. The adaptive immune system remembers everything, so it acquires information over your lifetime about particular viruses or things that have invaded your body, and then keeps a memory of that so that if it ever comes back, they know what to do. And this is why you only get chicken pox once, or why vaccines are really helpful. These cells also communicate with each other, and together they're meant to recognize every insult that could ever come across your body. So, you might be wondering at this point, if immune cells are so good, how come they don't already recognize cancer? And that's a fantastic question, and that's something that scientists are still trying to figure out. See, I told you before that your immune system recognizes things that aren't supposed to be there. 
But cancer cells are your own cells that have gone rogue on the inside. They're not foreign. And if they were already dying, we wouldn't have this problem anyway. The other thing that happens is that cancer cells um, contribute to a tumor suppressive environment. So even when the immune cells are able to recognize the cancer as being deadly, they can't do anything about it because the tumor suppresses them. I would think of it this way. Let's say you go out to dinner and there's always this friend who never brings their money and it's like, oh, I forgot, can you get me this time? And you finally have this speech and you say, okay, this time I'm gonna say something about it. I'm not gonna pay for their dinner. And you get to the restaurant and before you can get your speech out, you've already had dinner, maybe you've had a few drinks and you're having fun, you pay for their meal and you give them the ride for their taxi home. That's what cancer does to your immune system, completely overrides it, it's a horrible friend. <laughs> and so this is where immunotherapy comes in. How do we get the immune system to recognize in a strong way what cancer, cell, what cancer cells are and fight against it? There are two types of immunotherapy. One I'm calling active and passive. Active has what, what I've been talking about, where we actually redress your immune cells to be able to recognize the cancer cells as being deadly. And these have already led to clinical trials that were successful and even a first FDA approval of a drug in the last few years. However, these don't work for every single drug type, and there are some challenges with that. The research that I work on is more of a passive kind, which is simply relying on the fact that immune cells migrate with high efficiency and quantity to places of disease, such as cancer, and using them as drug delivery personalized vehicles to deliver the drugs that we know work well, but we cannot, by other methods, get them there on time. And I look at this using one of my favorite immune cells, because when you study so many, you get to pick your favorite. <laughs> my favorite immune cell is called the macrophage, and they are fatally attracted to the tumor environment. I say this because if you were to take out a tumor and you look at the individual cells, almost half of them could be filled with macrophages. They love going there. So they're a great drug delivery vehicle but they're not just useful for what happens in, outside of them, they're useful for what happens inside. In fact, if microglia had a social media page, <laughs> just because this is what I think about every day, um, if they had a social media page, I really think they'd have an Instagram because they love to eat everything and then tell you what it tasted like. <laughs> yeah, they're that friend. <laughs> Um, and so, that is their job. They are a professional eater. They are designed to go around and to phagocytose things that are not supposed to be there. They also can either digest them completely or shuttle some of that information back out to other cells. Now what my research and my collaborators have learned is that if you intentionally deliver a drug, they will also shuffle that back out to the surrounding cells. So by combining the natural migrating trafficking activity of the microglia combined with their normal functional activity in protecting your body, I can make these two concepts synergistic to actually help you fight cancer in your own body while you're not even thinking about it. If this sounds futuristic, that's because it is because I am actually proposing a new way of drug delivery, not just for cancer, but for any disease that involves immune cells, which are almost all of them. Parkinson's, heart attacks, spinal cord injury, diabetes, the list goes on. Who would have thought that my crazy fascination with nuclear energy would have turned into a love of physics, leading to wanting to make images, to leading to images of cancer, and then making drugs to treat cancer. I certainly wouldn't have thought that. I've been studying cancer for the last eight years, and in that time, I've tried to take a very interdisciplinary approach to it. I wanted to understand what it was gonna take to really defeat cancer once and for all. And I gotta tell you, treatments are just the tip of the iceberg. It's gonna take more than just finding that one drug that's gonna cure everyone. It's gonna take buy-in from the radiation oncologists and the surgeons. It's gonna take buy-in from the universities and the pharmaceutical companies that are developing these drugs, and then the FDA that approves the drugs, and then the insurance companies that need to pay for these drugs. 
It's going to take listening to patients and hearing what they have to say. It's going to take follow up with the survivors, letting them know that they are not, that we still care about them and that we are listening to their concerns. It's going to take caring about the quality of life of that patient, not just when they're in the treatment, but when it's done. It's not lost on me that the, the, the therapies that I'm trying to make may not be accessible to everyone. A single dose of immunotherapy could cost anywhere from $73,000 to $200,000. And annually, the U.S. spends $42.2 billion in health care, according to IMS Health. And even now, we still have disparities in treatment that can often be based on where you live, on your gender, um, and ethnicity. And so I believe a, a, tree, a true cure to cancer is going to involve looking at the whole picture and not just the treatment. But fear not, I'm very hopeful for our future and that we can get that done. I think that thinking about my career, we often do a disservice when we talk about science breakthroughs as a story that's already been written, as if there's nothing else to do. We're still using our sense of wonder to explore new avenues, to envision new ways to think of treatment. And sometimes people expect us to have all the answers. And while I have plenty of those, ask my mother, I have way more questions to answer. And sometimes scientists rush through those questions. We think, we don't have time. Let's stick to the predictions. Let's do what we think will work and only what we think will work because we can't afford to waste that. And when we do that, we shut down wonder. We dampen excitement and we stop progress. But we must hold on to our sense of wonder. We must let our mind and our ideas wander. Because when we do, when we let our mind wander, it will do wonderful things for our life and the lives of other people. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.